Good morning, Grace people. Today is Reformation Sunday, which means today we celebrate how God worked through Martin Luther to remind us that salvation is through faith alone. It's a reminder that God is always renewing us, calling us to grow in faith and love. So we were read today to symbolize the love and sacrifice of those that came before us. So let's raise our voices in a classic Reformation song, A Mighty Fortress. Please stand. Grace, we like to invite first and next steps with Jesus, and we have a few next steps for you this week. Hi, I'm Darren Vick, Senior Pastor here at Community of Grace. Every week we offer next steps you can take to worship, connect, and serve at CGLC. You may have noticed in the commons that we are kicking off our diaper drive this morning. For the next month, diapers of all sizes and brands will pile up in the commons so we can help families in need to keep their baby bottoms healthy and dry. One in three Minnesota families with young children struggle to pay for diapers. When they can't, disposable diapers are often left on too long or even rinsed out and reused. Please help us serve the smallest of our community by considering how you can participate in this month-long drive. You can learn more about the drive at the Serve Wall in the Commons. You can also choose to make a cash donation online. Then, experts say that commitment to prayer is the single consistent element found in every church revival or revitalization. That is why, as we seek to discern where the Lord is leading Community of Grace Ministries, 
We are hosting a prayer vigil beginning November 9th at 7 a.m. and ending 24 hours later. Members of the church and schools will seek the Lord's heart in prayer for half hour increments. Then afterward, share with us what they heard God say about how we can work better together and how we can better serve the greater community. This is intentionally happening at the end of our Spirit of Grace sermon series, which has purposefully laid out the values our church is leaning into. We have a sign-up available through Church Center and also at the information desk. Sign up for a half-hour slot to pray, either by yourself or with your family. There will be prayer stations and a prayer guide available here at CGLC, or you can choose to pray from home and we'll send you a prayer guide via email. Please make sure you specify if you will be praying in the building or at home. And as always, we are happy to help you navigate the sign-up process. Please join us as we seek the next steps in our Grace Together journey. Finally, the Christmas tea is making a comeback. You will find this year's event director, Glenda Schooneman, at her festive table in the Commons. She is looking for help putting together this event, scheduled for the first Saturday in December. Tickets will go on sale next month. You can sign up for most events online on Church Center and find other next steps in your copy of The Latest Current. Thanks for joining us this morning. Have a great week, Grace people. Thank you, Pastor Darren. We come together every Sunday to remember our God's love for us. So if you're new here, welcome. We would love to connect with you, and the best place to do that is out at the orange wall right out in the commons. So we've been speaking for the past few weeks about some new values here at Community of Grace. Um, and how we can apply them, not just here in the building, but also out in the world. So today we're speaking about teaching the way that Jesus teaches others. And there's a couple of verses that really speak about Jesus the teacher. So one that really sticks out to me is John 13, verses 12 through 17, right after Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. So Pastor Angie talked about this verse last week when discussing loving and serving the way that Jesus does. But I also believe it fits for teaching the way that Jesus teaches. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. With those words in our minds and hearts, let's stand and continue worshiping together.
Yeah. 
may be seated. The reading today is a parable of Jesus from Luke chapter 13, verses 20 through 21. I will be reading the parable three times. The first time, listen for a word that stands out to you. The second time, let it bring an image to your mind. The third time, ask, Lord, what are you telling me in this? Again, Jesus asked, What shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. What word stood out to you? This time, let an image come to mind. Again, Jesus asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. What did you picture? This last time, ask, Lord, what are you telling me in this? Again, Jesus asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to those who are joining us online this morning as well. Well, we have been learning about our mission to help others know Jesus through four missional values recently. And the first three, we can live out with anyone at any time. They're kind of a new take on what would Jesus do, right? Because when we look at the person in front of us, we can ask, how do we see them? the way that Jesus sees? How do we love them the way that Jesus loves? How do we serve them like Jesus serves so that they can come to know Jesus through us? But today, we're moving into the last of our four missional values to teach people the way Jesus teaches people. And we have to recognize this one takes a little bit more discernment because teaching only lands when a person is open to learning, right? Who taught you about Jesus? Who first helped you get to know him? And what helps you now? In a way, when we see, love, and serve others like Jesus, we are already teaching because our actions teach about the Savior that we love. But teaching the way that Jesus teaches involves us speaking about the Lord. And for that, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to show us, to nudge us, to guide us into what kind of teaching the unique person in front of us is ready to receive. And that, too, we learn from Jesus. Because in the scriptures, Jesus teaches different people in different situations in very different ways. Often, Jesus teaches by responding to people's questions with a question of his own, or by starting a conversation with a question. Jesus also often teaches by telling stories or parables or using analogies from daily life. The kingdom of God is like, dot, dot, dot. Jesus teaches by his own example, 
as I have done, so now you do. And Jesus teaches by giving his disciples instruction and then sending them out to try doing it. And they try and they sometimes fail, and when they ask their questions, they grow. So our hope would be that when we teach people the way Jesus teaches in normal life, by asking people questions about what they're looking for, by telling our stories, by our example, by walking alongside others as they try out faith, by speaking simple truth, all through the Holy Spirit's prompting, that's when hearts start to open to hear the life-transforming hope that only Jesus brings. But it takes discernment how we live this out. Because one of the things Jesus taught his disciples and us is that sometimes and situations are not the right time to teach. There are times it's better for our witness to be silent than to speak. When someone is hostile toward the things of God, te- trying to teach them at that moment might actually steal their hearts against hearing it. Trying to teach people at the wrong time can actually turn them off to things that they might otherwise be open to hearing. And that's why Jesus tells his disciples, for their own sake as well as for the sake of the gospel, in Matthew 7, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So what does Jesus mean here? Well, there are times when otherwise reasonable people will react out of their animal brain instead of their usual one. And usually these are times of stress or fear or anger. A person who is in fight or flight mode is not ready to receive anything. (laughs) And anything you try to offer in that kind of moment, they will just end up trampling over or tearing apart in an impulse of self-preservation. And you might notice... In encountering someone hostile, Jesus' teaching most often leads us not to use words, but instead to employ techniques of de-escalation through unexpected love. From Matthew 5, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And as Paul wrote in Romans 12, and he's quoting from Proverbs 25 here, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So what are the burning coals of this kindness? That's the burn you feel when a person realizes that they've been behaving like an animal toward a fellow human being who actually bears them no ill will. It's the heat that comes from slamming the brakes on our own reactions when we stop seeing red and just start to see. So how does that return to sanity happen? Kindness. Disarming kindness. To meet hostility with love instead of a fight can actually soften a heart to a point where they can hear the hope and the peace Jesus brings. But if not, if nothing else, it will show them that you're serious about actually doing the stuff that Jesus teaches. Turn the other cheek, pray for those who persecute you. That in itself teaches, doesn't it? As a general rule, I would say don't try to teach people about Jesus if they're in a place of hostility or anger. But there are exceptions to every rule. There are people in this world for whom a feisty, hostile-feeling debate is how they seek to learn about something they really want to know more about. Now, if you know somebody like this, you've probably already pictured them in your mind, right? For that person, maybe you are called to teach them when they approach you with hostility because for them, it means they are open. But for most people, hostility means the opposite. Their heart is shut down. They're not ready to learn. So most of the time, if there's hostility, just meet it with love and save your words for times and situations when presenting the treasure of the gospel can hit hearts that are open to receiving it. Martin Luther learned this lesson the hard way during the Reformation. The first time the Holy Spirit opened his heart to really see the truth of the gospel, that Jesus came to save sinners, that God doesn't demand that we save ourselves. He simply calls us to receive the salvation he freely gives us 
purchased for us by Jesus' saving work completed on the cross. When Luther first understood this, he wanted to shout it from the rooftops. This is good news. We have a savior. We are free. We're free to love God and each other and to try and to fail as we grow. And he was so excited about this good news that it absolutely appalled him when he encountered the Pope's newest fundraising strategy to build St. Peter's in Rome, the selling of indulgences. Depending on how much money a person gave toward the building project, the Pope promised to spring the soul of a deceased loved one 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 years earlier than the time slotted in purgatory for them to serve and get them right into heaven. Imagine the suffering your money could spare them. Luther was appalled because he had just learned in Scripture that the saving grace of Jesus that cost him everything is freely given to us by faith. That grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Christ's expense, not ours. The sin debt has already been paid in full. That's what it means to have a Savior. So he immediately wrote to the Pope to point out this grave theological error, sure that the Pope would be as joyful as he was to hear that Christ's salvation is free for all. And what poor, earnest young Luther failed to realize was how strong a grip the idols of money and power had on those he was writing to. He knew this truth would disrupt the capital campaign, but what he didn't imagine was that the Pope at the time was not interested in utilizing the power of the gospel to set people free. He would rather stick with utilizing the power of fear to scare money out of the faithful to add to his own power and glory. And Luther watched as the pearl of the gospel was trampled by the very people who should have rejoiced in it the most. Horribly disappointed, Luther was further appalled to discover that now he was being excommunicated, thrown out of the church for pointing out the gospel truth. He had naively expected that the truth of the gospel would transform the places of power and then flow down to the people through them. But that was not what God did. Instead, Luther learned that Jesus' kingdom works very differently than the kings and kingdoms of this world. It is not controlled by the powerful. Instead, God seeds it into the world through the lives of the humble. So Martin gave up trying to convince those in power, and he dedicated his energy instead to giving the gospel to those who need it. The humble parishes around him, and the good news began to spread. He took the yeast of the good news... Uh, and he started to work that good news into the quiet places of the churches of his parish, much like the woman in Jesus' parable, who back then, of course, also had no power over the things of the world, a woman who would take yeast and work it through day in, day out through a batch of dough. Now, it takes a long time to work yeast through 60 pounds of dough. This bag is 5 pounds. Imagine 12 of these. That takes a lot of time and a lot of work to work the yeast through 60 pounds of dough, but how many people will the bread that rises from that yeast and 60 pounds of dough feed? That little bit of yeast, lovingly, faithfully works, can have an enormous impact. So Luther learned, as we do, that God works in the little things through the steady faithfulness of his people to grow his kingdom in many hearts, one heart at a time. He doesn't do top down. Instead, he stoops down to engage us in the places where we feel flattened. And he works there, kneading through each lifeless part until his life and hope is infused in us. And then he steps back and watches us rise. Through the work of Martin Luther, the church experienced a reformation, a reforming, a recentering of hearts on Jesus in a way that changed the world forever. And Luther himself found this hope when he had been the place of the deepest despair, when his own heart had been dry and flattened. He knew how much the world needed this hope because he knew how much he himself needed it. That's why he had to share it with others. Teaching like Jesus teaches is teaching that plants a seed that the Holy Spirit then will grow in the lives of others. It's the small but consistent teaching, a life that has found Jesus' grace that works the yeast into those seeking hope around us. But 
When knowing when to teach, as Jesus teaches, that starts with asking the question, what do the people around us need? What are they looking for? I recently attended a LCMC conference in Marion, Iowa, and there I heard a story from a pastor from a church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he said his city was actually the Mile High City, and people are often taken by surprise by the effect of the altitude when they visit. Visitors there consistently tell, them, tell him shortly after they arrive, I think I'm getting sick, because they start to have headaches, nausea, dizziness, fatigue, lack of appetite. And when that happens, he immediately tells them, drink more water and rest. And they say, well, I'm not really thirsty, though. And he says, I know you think that, but water is what you need, water and rest. Because at high altitudes, the dry air can trick your body into feeling less thirsty, even though you're actually dehydrated. And you breathe more rapidly at higher altitudes, which makes you lose more water through your lungs. And at high elevations, your body needs more oxygen to be circulated through your body. But when you're dehydrated, it impacts your blood volume just when you need more and not less. Something about altitude suppresses the normal thirst instinct. So although people all feel the symptoms that they're lacking something, they don't think they want or need the one thing they need most. They have to be told what their body is crying out for. Our world today is dealing with all the symptoms of soul sickness, loneliness, hopelessness, isolation, fear, anxiety, and depression to greater degrees than ever before. People desperately need the hope, the peace, the unshakable foundation of Jesus' redeeming love and lordship in their lives. They need to know God's grace and forgiveness and his promise is for them. Because no matter what happens in this turbulent and unpredictable world, no matter what else changes, Jesus is Lord. And he was, and he is, and he will be Lord for them and for all the world, no matter what. And he is faithful to walk with us through every day that will come, no matter what. We have a Savior, and one day when this broken world ends, he himself will make for us a new beginning, all things new. No matter what happens here, we have hope for the future because our hope is not in us. It's in Jesus, and his promises are as sure as the dawn. And that truth, that hope, that peace is what our soul-sick world desperately needs most. It's what all the symptoms point toward. It's what their very being is crying out for. And yet, so many times, it's the very last thing they think they want. You might think that's unique about today, but it's just fallen human nature. People tend not to be able to see what they need most. That's why we need to learn from Jesus. How does Jesus teach us in ways that sink past our defenses, not just into our minds and our hearts, but into our thirsty souls? So we're going to take a look today at how Jesus uses a bunch of teaching techniques and a life-changing interaction with a woman alone at a well in John chapter 4. See what we can learn. So here's the situation. Jesus and his disciples are traveling through a region called Samaria, and there had been quite a lot of animosity between the Hebrews and the Samaritans in the past, so this was unfriendly, if not exactly hostile territory for them to be traveling through, and Jesus makes the unusual choice to send his disciples on ahead to get food while he waits alone at a well in the hot sun at noon. So what can we learn from, about teaching from Jesus here? Number one, Make the setting as safe as possible. Now, you might wonder, why does Jesus wait alone at the well for this woman? That might seem kind of scandalous, kind of risky. But when you want to invite someone into having a deeply personal conversation about faith, for most people, if they're going to get vulnerable with what's real, they need a private, safe space. And we see in this story later on, when the disciples come back and they see this Samaritan woman talking to Jesus, they're not enthusiastic about it. So I'm pretty sure if Jesus hadn't sent them away, this life-transforming conversation with this woman would not have happened. Timing matters, and setting matters for faith-teaching conversations. Teaching people the way that Jesus teaches people many times means finding quiet, private times and safe spaces where you can talk about what's real, 
with someone. That takes to number two, to approach from a place of vulnerability. Sitting at this well, waiting for this woman, Jesus is already tired from walking. He's hot. He's probably dehydrated. And then this woman spots him, this unknown man from a different tribe, and he's sitting between her and the well she needs to get her water from. She's probably pretty wary. She doesn't know him, doesn't know his intentions. She might even be afraid to approach the well. But then Jesus asks her for her help. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, the woman immediately reacts with surprise and a bit of sassiness. She's pretty sassy. Can, how can you ask me for a drink? You're a Jewish man. I'm a Samaritan woman. Most men of Jesus' day would not even have spoken to her, much less drink water out of her water jar. And the very fact that Jesus seems to have no problem with either of those completely catches her by surprise. Her answer is amused and also a bit defensive. But Jesus has approached her with vulnerability he needs water, and she has the power to give it. So he asks her to share the power she has to help him. If we want to teach someone like Jesus, it often means starting with our own vulnerability by sharing stories of our own needs that we need Jesus to meet for us or by asking for their help, helping us understand things we don't understand of how people are resistant to faith or church or talk about God, asking someone, can you help me understand? And truly listening and learning from them is a way, a Christ-like way, of inviting someone into a conversation that starts with acknowledging the value of the person in front of you. Approach from a place of vulnerability. And then third, make it clear that what's being offered is for them. When this woman teases Jesus about not being sure how he could even ask her for a drink, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Not people, not those who ask, you. Jesus is talking about her. He's talking to her. And hearing that, she's interested, and she's ready to kick the tires on what it is he's talking about. Which leads us to the fourth, don't be afraid of questions. Questions are good. On the outset, it might look like this woman is rejecting what Jesus is saying with her questions, but her questions are really engagement, and Jesus is engaging her in them. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Which brings us to number five. Using analogy, metaphor, and stories can be really helpful. In a desert climate, water was life. You run out of water, you die, and it was precious. This woman had to walk to this well every day and draw it up herself in order to have it. So water that welled up inside her, water she didn't have to work to produce, that just kept on giving what she needed, an offer like that would be really hard to ignore. When Jesus uses imagery, metaphor, and analogy, he's trying to help us to see what the gifts that he gives us are like what his kingdom is like, how the thirsts that we don't even know we have can be quenched by the hope that he came to give us. Now, images tend to stick with us long after words have been forgotten, and that's why using them or telling our stories can be impactful in teaching the things of Jesus. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now, at this point in their interaction, this woman is ready to call Jesus on what he's saying. It looks like she's invested, but Jesus knows she's still wearing a mask. She's enjoying this conversation, but she's play-acting the part. Because deep down, she's holding back what's real. If he knew the truth about me, if he knew anything about me, he wouldn't be offering me this. He wouldn't be talking to me at all. So Jesus makes things real. Which leads to number six, don't let them use their sin as a barrier. Have you ever heard someone say jokingly something like, I couldn't come to your church, I'd get struck by lightning if I tried to walk in the door. 
That kind of joke covers a real belief. I'm too messed up for God. I'm too sinful. I'm too selfish. I'm too broken. You fill in the blank for the Lord to want. That kind of statement shows they don't know that Jesus came for sinners, that he hung out with people that polite society stayed away from, and he did that on purpose because he wanted them to know that God's grace makes outsiders into family. But this woman was pretty sure her sin had disqualified her from being able to have what Jesus was offering. And Jesus knew they could not have a real conversation about God's love for her until he addressed what she wouldn't talk about. So he told her to go get her husband, to which she could only respond, I don't have one, which then gave him the opportunity to tell her, yes, I know that. I know you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you said is quite true. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's saying, yes, I know. I know all about your past. I know about the shame you have about your past and your present, but I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm here to talk about you. And what you have just shown me is that you are a person who speaks the truth. I want to have a conversation with her. And just like that, she's all in. Jesus moves us beyond our shame to show us instead what he sees in us, what can be, until we see it too. In your conversation with people about faith, don't let them make their sin a barrier to the conversation. Let them know Jesus sees it. He's not dismissing it. He'll work on it with them. But what he's interested in right now is them. No sin is bigger than his sacrifice for those who will receive his grace. So knowing now that Jesus really does want to talk with her about something real, she goes deep, right into a centuries-old theological disagreement. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Which brings us to number seven, the final point. Speak the truth plainly. Jesus hardly ever spoke the truth about his being the Messiah like this, but this woman needed her truth straight up, so that's what he gave her. He saw in her one who worshiped in spirit and in truth, the kind of worshiper the Father seeks, and now she saw that he was the one who came to redeem her, to reclaim her as God's beloved one. Doesn't get much more straight up than that. And after this conversation, this woman ran back to the village and told everyone how he knew her, how he is the Messiah, and how he came even for them, Samaritans, who had previously been considered by everyone as outsiders to the kingdom of God. And hearing her, many came to ask their own questions, and Jesus stayed with them two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Like yeast worked into the dough, the joy of this woman's experience with Jesus spread hope throughout the whole community until they saw faith rise in many. To teach people as Jesus teaches people takes discernment, It takes our vulnerability. It takes seeing people's unique hearts. And most of all, it takes our own commitment to continue growing and leaning into the Holy Spirit's leading of us, knowing Jesus' hope and peace for our own needs. There's a reason that this value is the last one. (laughs) We will always be growing in this, but it's important because our world is dying of thirst and he is the living water for us all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you teach us, the way that you know us, 
the way that you came to redeem us. Thank you for speaking into our lives of the hope that we need for our faith to rise. So Lord, we pray that uh, we would continue to learn from your teaching in our lives and that you would in turn make us teachers of your grace uh, through our words, our deeds, our stories, our vulnerability, um, until all the world knows the hope that only you can give. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Angie. So one of the things that really stood out to me when Pastor Angie read through the verses was Jesus was able to talk with that woman who said things like, once, once the Son of Man comes, then he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus' answer just sticks out so well of just, I am he. Th three small words that really just bring comfort. I am he. That really just, just stood out. So now we're going to move into a time of offering to the Lord. If you'd like to give online, there will be a code up on the screens. Otherwise, the ushers will be coming forward. And as always, we pray, God, use these gifts to build your kingdom and not ours. Ushers, you may come forward.
it's a song called Send Me. And really the meaning behind the song is knowing that God is sending us to different places and being willing and there to say, here I am, Lord, send me. So I really encourage you to listen to the song and follow along if you catch on to the tune, but no worries if you don't. It's bandaging the broken, washing filthy feet. Here I am, Lord, send me. If it's loving one another, even when we don't agree. Here I am, Lord, send me.
we will answer and we will say, I am here, Lord, send me. Over all the hills and valleys of the world, Lord, send us. Thank you for teaching us how to teach others, Lord. Because we know the lessons that we teach aren't ours, they are yours, Lord. Thank you for teaching us, Lord. You now we pray together the Holy Spirit prayer. Holy Spirit, fill me with the grace of Jesus. Fill me with the love of Jesus. Fill me with the power of Jesus. Fill me with the life of Jesus. All for your glory, Jesus. Amen. Now we pray how Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as we prepare to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Receive this blessing as you go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon your life with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Now go in peace and serve the Lord.